And today, it's great to have you with us on this Friday. We are presented by Gatorade. It is, of course, the Friday walkthrough. Dave Revson, Nicole Auerbach, Jerry DiNardo. A special thanks as well to all of our veterans for their service to our country on this Veterans Day. Uh, normally, we would dive right into the games, but, but we're in more of a waiting game right now, and, and we'll get to that in a moment. But obviously, just a, a waiting word here from Michigan. That is our big story, so let's just dive right into it. Still no official word from the Big Ten on the status of Wolverines coach Jim Harbaugh, though an announcement of some sort is expected today. The league reportedly considering invoking its sportsmanship clause to levy a punishment against Michigan, perhaps against their coach. The team is accused of stealing signs via in-person scouting, which is against NCAA rules. And if you don't know that by now, I would be astonished that you're actually watching this program. Uh, Nicole, what, what's the latest? What are you hearing? Well, the latest is that we are continuing to wait. Um, people don't know exactly when this is coming, but there is something expected today. Um, again, we know that Commissioner Tony Petiti has the authority to invoke some sort of action against Michigan under the sportsmanship policy. If it is a punishment that goes beyond a $10,000 fine or two-game suspension, he does need approval from presidents and a special board uh, to, en to enact that. But at this point, we're all just waiting to see. This is stretched out. Michigan had until Wednesday to respond. We've seen that 10-page letter that they sent to the conference arguing why they don't think they should be penalized at this stage before the completion of the NCAA investigation. But the Big Ten is weighing its options, including potential suspension, fines, et cetera. We just don't know. And we're on the eve of a game. Michigan's about to be traveling to Penn State. And everyone's just kind of in a holding pattern, Jerry. Yeah, with, with a huge game tomorrow. You, you know, I, I think one of the most powerful things a, a coach or a teacher has is a connection with their, their students, right? And I, Jim Harbaugh, to me, watching him, Reverend, we get to see him up close and personal in August. He is really connected with this team individually. I think of Blake Corum, I think of J.J., that if he is suspended at the 12th hour, which I guess that's the only hour we have left, right, it will be an incredible emotional positive boost for this Michigan team huh. going to the Penn State, going into the Penn State game. It won't be a downer. It'll be an upper because they want to defend their coach. They want to play for their coach. And it's going to be one of these win one for the Gippers because he is very much a player's coach as far as personal relationships. Well, and we saw them do that when he was suspended earlier in the season. They had their, their tribute to him. So I, I, I do think that affects it. The timing of all of this, if there is a suspension, really does create a unique situation, I think, for both sides, Michigan and Penn State. It's going to be fascinating to see how it unfolds. As soon as we know something, you will know something. <laughs> but in the meantime, I think all we can do is forge on and, and talk about the game. Game, and it is a great game. I mean, this is one of those games we've had circled all year. I've been saying it all week. And this is the second straight year these two have met with both in the AP Top 10. So you might think that's commonplace, but the truth is it is not. Prior to last season, it had not happened in nearly 25 years. It's just the fourth time in 27 all-time meetings that this game has matched top 10 teams. We'll get to the X's and O's in a moment. But the stakes to me are really interesting here, Jerry. We've talked a lot about Penn State. We saw them in camp. We thought they were on, certainly on a level with Ohio State. Whether or not they were on a level with Michigan, I, I think is debatable. Ohio State had its way with Penn State. That did not come down to being a particularly close game. It was one score game at the end, but it came down to the, the very end. It was a two score game for all intents and purposes at the end of this one. So now this is the chance for Penn State to prove hey, we are at, on a plane with Michigan. And then from the Wolverines' point of view, you've got all this other stuff going on, but you're also trying for the, you have your first game all year against a ranked team, and, and you have a chance to prove that, hey, you are as good as your ranking. So let's look at the differences since the Ohio State game, right? The obvious difference is they're in State College, which could be a tremendous boost. Drew Aller had a tough time against Ohio State. It wasn't it wasn't necessarily his fault. I think they rushed to 47 yards. I think he was sacked four times. I mean, it wasn't only about Drew Allen, but it was a big moment for him. Now it's a big moment for Drew Allen at home. So I think that's where it's changed for, uh, for Penn State. Interesting with Michigan is the zone read that – most teams run that J.J. has been running until like the last month he hasn't run it. Is that going to be different for the Michigan offense in this game than it has been? Because they haven't needed that play 
when you play against that Penn State defense, if you don't have the zone read, man, you're going to make it hard on those five guys up up front. So to me, those are the two things that changes. What's J.J. going to do and Drew's maturity, if you will? Well, and I mean, just what else could Michigan do in a situation they haven't been in? I, I think as you talk specifically about the zone read, it also goes larger about, you know, what ha- what happens when they are going against a defense that, you know, has a lot of negative plays, gets in the backfield, pressures J.J. McCarthy, has talent at every level of that defense, and you're just going up against the best team that you have so far. What do we learn about Michigan? So many people have just dinged them for their, res- their resume to date, yeah. despite the fact that they are in the top four of the CFP rankings. A lot of that is based on the dominance that they've had on both sides of the ball against lesser competition. But this is where you really make your your hay. And this is where people really start to take you seriously. We haven't seen them play one of these games yet. And then for Penn State, 4-15 and 15 against Michigan and Ohio State since James Franklin's taken over. So this is a prime opportunity. We talk about them taking that next step as a program. This is a game. It's at home. All the turmoil around Michigan. So why not now? Yeah, they're 1-21 in 21 against top five teams this century, Penn State is. So I know James Franklin gets a lot of, hey, it's 4-15 you know, hey, and 15 and all that. And, and again, all that's accurate. But this was a problem that predated James Franklin. This has been an right. issue that's gone on for quite a while. It includes the you know, Joe Paterno is yeah. included in that one in 21. So I guess my question is, given those stakes for Michigan of, hey, you haven't played anyone who's ranked all year and you have some people doubting you and you've got all this other stuff going on, and given the stakes for Penn State of, are you finally at this level, as we outlined, who has more at stake? Who needs this game more? Penn State, because if there are three teams in the East that could win it, Penn State needs to win right to stay in it, right? I mean, uh, I talked earlier this year thinking that it's possible that all three of these teams could have one loss to each other. And so if it's, it's obvious if Penn State loses, they were at, they're out of the hunt. So it's more important to Penn State. You know, whether it's more important program-wise, I, you know, that's maybe the same question, but as far as the season is concerned, it, uh, to me, it's obviously more about Penn State. I think it's Penn State because we've seen Michigan break through, right? We were waiting for them to beat Ohio State, win a Big Ten championship. They did that. We, we know what to expect and what the high end does for them. Penn State's trying to get to that level, and this is the last year of the four-team playoff where you really need to win your conference to have a chance, and this keeps them alive in that. Yeah, I mean, Nicole, and you bring up a, a great point, too, because before Michigan could win two in a row, they had it that first one is yeah. always the one that gives not only your present team confidence for the rest of the year, but it gives you next year's team. So we stopped talking about the stats that Reverend gave us. We stopped talking about James counts every game the same and all that. We, that conversation stops, and I think the, the, the Penn State players would welcome him welcome that conversation going away oh yes I think that's true and you look at kind of the way that the talent is stacked here for Penn State and they had the great freshman class last year and so you know you still have next year with that group and 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 you're in the 12-team playoff world I guess I would just say next year they have UCLA USC Ohio State Washington and at Wisconsin so I know people say well it won't be such a big deal when you're in the 12-team playoff world I'm not sure that's a of an easy path by any stretch. So, so again, you try to get it, you know, strike while the iron's hot. And, and this is, again, on paper, based on what we saw in camp, a, a pretty good team. Let's get it. Oh, you had yeah, to, I have yeah. one more thing, though, Reverend. Th- this game also impacts recruiting, just like the Ohio right. State loss impacts recruiting. And you, that's scheduled about next year. You know, if they don't win one of these games, you know, people are going to play that against them. They're going to read that schedule off and say, when was the last time Penn State won a big game? Look at all the big games next year. Why would you go there? I mean, I mean the recruiting implications of these games against one another is pretty big. I do want to get into the X's and O's. You touched on a little bit when Michigan has the ball and the read option for J.J. How do you see this matchup against the Penn State defense? I, I think they're going to have to use the quarterback run game, but – you know, the problem with that is you put J.J. in harm's way. And the other problem from a technical standpoint, even if they've been running it all week during practice but saving it for a big game like that, the mesh and the speed of the real game can make it difficult for that quarterback and tailback really to be on the same page. So the only thing I see changing for Michigan's offense is if they're going to run the zone read. Well, one thing that I wonder, which kind of is connected to this, is about Michigan's run game as a whole because it's not been like it was last year. Right. And we talked about how Jim Harbaugh has kind of taken a different approach, right, and he's decided to take Blake out of games earlier. But, 
you know, they haven't really had those breakaway plays. They haven't had those big explosive plays in the run game. They're very good when it's like third and short or you're on the goal line, you give the ball to Blake Corum, but are they going to need more from the run game in this game that we haven't really seen? You know, all three of these teams in the East, you know, Henderson had a big day last week against Rutgers. That's the first time the running backs at Ohio State, Michigan, and Penn State. Have been explosive. And been yeah. like last year, yeah. right? Last yeah. year they were all explosive, and it's almost like a trend. It's almost like they all decided – hey, let's not run the running backs all that much. It, it is crazy. I mean, I think it's actually kind of conference-wide. I mean, you think about yes. the Doak Walker Award. There are years where you feel like there are three Big yeah. Ten candidates right. mm -hmm. for Last that. Last year. And, and, yeah, you know, yeah. where it's reasonable to say all the best running backs in the, the nation are from the Big Ten, and it just doesn't feel that way this year. And that's probably a relief for Penn State anyway because – Michigan ran for more than 400 yards on the miss we know yeah. last year. Michigan barely went over 100 against Purdue, about three yards a carry against one of the rushing defenses that is struggling the most in the Big Ten in the Boilermakers. What about the other side? When Penn State has the ball, we've talked a lot this year about the lack of explosion. I don't know that anything has happened necessarily to counter that notion, although they are coming off at least – in my mind, their best offensive performance of the year. I was going to say that. I think there's some confidence that can be gained off of what we saw last week. And then also for Drew Aller getting different players involved, right? Dante Cephas becoming a target. Um, we've talked a lot about that receiving room. It's, you know, when you come out of the Ohio State game, there's a big gap, right, between the receivers that one team has and the other. But if you can get other guys involved, multiple tight ends, Drew Aller coming in with confidence, coming off his best performance. I do think that gives you some options offensively. Again, even if the, uh, the run game and the pass game aren't as explosive as we're used to seeing, options, connections, chemistry, that creates some opportunity against tough defense. Yeah, I, I think it's one of these games where, you, you know, you say to Drew, what are you most comfortable with? I mean, his confidence early in the game will dictate whether this is going to be a, a well-performing Penn State offense. I mean, he has to feel comfortable. He, I go back to that first away game against Northwestern, who's got a good defense, but not like this. He didn't feel – you could tell he wasn't playing at home, right? Yeah. So I think they've got to say to, to Al, what do you want to run? And the play selection by Mike Yersich, the offensive coordinator, has to be based on – what Drew's comfortable with, and then I think I'd get the offensive line in the room and just threaten them that they better, they better protect them, otherwise I'm taking their clothes out of their locker. <laughs> <laughs> like I don't know that that flies in this day I, and age. I know. I just think the offensive line, you, you know. It's this a, is because Jerry has one outfit, so, like, he would – the idea of taking clothes would be oh, – come on. He's yeah. still got – he's got his – the shirt he got when he was a GA at the University of Maine. He that's still why has that. I'm saying that's why taking yeah. clothes. I'm partial would be to my Eastern Michigan. Series. Yeah, the Eastern Michigan. Well, they really they had a great clothes. <laughs> but that's why it would be it would yeah. mean a lot to you to lose your clothes. No, I I think I think you're completely right about um, putting Drew Aller in a comfortable position, and we can see what he learned from that Ohio State game right. because you talked about the environments he's been in. The big storyline coming to that one was, hey, how is he going to handle this? Now you have another monster game, but you get it at home. How does he look in this game? No it is still crazy to me that we are nine games into the season and Michigan has yet to allow a goal-to-go situation all year, right? And that, that tells you that you might need to beat them over the top or you certainly need to beat them from outside the 10-yard line. And, and is Penn State in a position to do that? I mean, Reverend, you could get right to the goal line, tell a couple guys to jump off sides and keep moving the ball back until you <laughs> yeah. keep the stat yeah. alive. Yeah. Keep the stat. Right. Well, do they bring back the T formation down there if yeah. Penn State does get down around the goal line? Lots of intrigue in this one. It, it is going to be a great game. It'll be fast. Hold serve against a pretty good Rutgers team. I feel like every time we talk about someone leading the West, we accidentally jinx them. <laughs> um, but it does feel like of the styles of play that win the West, Iowa does it the best. Um, but this is going to be a low-scoring game. These are two great defenses, and I think it's going to be about who makes fewer mistakes. Rutgers is really good in terms of time of possession. We talk a lot about Shiano ball and running the ball and trying to control possessions that way. I think that's going to be necessary and not being penalized. They're going to have to play a clean game to beat Iowa because Iowa plays this way and is very comfortable winning these defensive struggles. You know, the way you stated all that, it, it, it speaks to how far Greg Shiano has brought this program, right? He's six and three going into Iowa City. They both have really good defenses. I mean, Four years ago when Greg first got there for the second time, if you'd have said there's going to come a time when Rutgers' defense is going to be called by Nicole the same as Iowa's, that's pretty impressive, right? They're both struggling a little bit offensively, although Iowa certainly 
is trying to run the option to their advantage, whereas Iowa just lines up basically in an I formation at one back and runs traditional plays. But the game for Rutgers is more than just the game, I think. I, I, when you look at progress of a program like Rutgers, you look at getting to six wins. So they're six and three now with, with a couple games left, and they're going into Iowa, and we're all talking like this is going to be a game, which I think we're all expecting. So it really speaks volumes for what Greg Schiano has done at Iowa. It's going to be a game. It's also going to be a quick game, I think. So <laughs> I'm, I'm excited, right? Like, you come in to work on Saturday, and I think we're going to get a lot of fill time in between the end of this game and the beginning of volleyball. So I'm fired up about that, right? It could take an hour and a half. So you're prepping for fill time. That's, that's a little unusual. Yeah. yeah, I'm excited about it. We'll get some punting packages ready to go. <laughs> right, Probably exactly. See field position battle. But that is, that is what we expect out of this game. It's hard to imagine it's not going to look that way. Interesting note, Kirk Ferentz with a win would pull even with Bo Schembechler, third on the all-time wins list for a Big Ten coach behind only Woody Hayes and Amos Alonzo Stack. Wow. That is wow. uh, some impressive. Some heady company. Nicole, you are going to Ohio State. They're trying to stay unbeaten, taking on a Michigan State team that I think we can say for the first time in a while is feeling pretty good about itself. What do you think about this one? What would it take for Michigan State to keep it close and have a chance there at the end? Well, they need to they need to play like they have in the last couple games. They're coming short against a couple of teams. They finally break through against Nebraska. We saw the relief and the emotion in the post game there about what that meant for that program on senior day. But you have to play clean. This has been their problem throughout most of this season is a lot of mistakes, a lot of turnovers, and then giving up big plays. And, I, you know, it's just it's, it's all of those things they're going to have to just really clean up. And then I think you need a much more efficient performance at the quarterback position to put you in position to hang there. It's going to be really hard. One team has Marvin Harrison. One team has Travion Henderson healthy. It's a lot of different weapons. So you have to try to hang in there somehow and sustain drives, eat clock, do all of those things and not make mistakes. And, you know, for Ryan Day, this is right up his alley. I, I mean, he has had a difficult season, to say the least. And I think we're watching his best coaching job. You, you take last week against Rutgers, all of a sudden, Henderson caught four or five passes, right? We haven't seen that, right? So he, he's winning in different ways. He doesn't have a Heisman Trophy candidate at quarterback. He, he let Jim Knowles fix the defense, right? So th this is really some good work. We talk about the Ohio State coach never getting coach of the year because so much is expected. This is a year depending on how it ends up. So Michigan State being the best, they, the best version of themselves to this point is right up Ohio State's alley because th this is kind of the way it, it's been. But you have to feel good and positive about the Michigan State players and all the emotion from winning a game. Yeah, absolutely. And again, if Ohio State does the things that we've seen them do, they should be pretty comfortable in this game. But, you know, again, if that run game doesn't show up the way that it has when Travion Henderson's been healthy, these slow starts, there's a chance right. Michigan State could stay in the game. But there's just so much to like about the Buckeyes and their in-game resilience when they've had these slow starts or Kyle McCord has turned the ball over. So, again, I don't expect that from Ohio State, but Michigan State needs to do all of those things and take care of the ball to give themselves a chance. Yeah, taking care of the ball is the huge part, as you said. And as we saw, I mean, they had had over the previous five games, they had had 16 turnovers. And then last week, you don't turn the ball over, and lo and behold, you, play you win the game. And you play a team that turns the ball over. Yes, <laughs> so and, and we're getting to that team. Yeah. That team is Nebraska. They will take on Maryland. Uh, this, to me, is, is a fascinating game because you have two teams that are on the precipice of bowl eligibility. It's the winner goes to a bowl bowl. Uh, the difference is that Nebraska has kind of had to rally to get there last week aside where they did not play well. Maryland has been on the precipice of bowl eligibility since September 30th, right? right. I mean, they ended September with five wins, and they ended October with five wins, and now they're going to be going to November 11th with five wins. I mean, we're kind of getting to a point of desperation here, Coach. Good matchup for Nebraska. I mean, everything makes you lean towards Nebraska. They're at home. These fans will be more excited than any other fan base in the history of college football to see their team get the sixth win. I mean, to talk about Nebraska not going to bowl games, whatever the length has been, is, Six is, years. is, is yeah. incredible that you would ever think that they yeah. couldn't get the six wins six straight years, right? So I think emotions will be high. The matchup, I think, is, is really good. I think Maryland comes in. 
they're they're pressing. I mean, they 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 have to be pressing because of the losing streak. And when they press, I think Leah presses, and I think for the Nebraska defense to get X and O on you is they will contain Leah. They will not let him out of the package. I went back and watched JJ against Nebraska, and they clearly had a contained JJ plan. The same plan is going to be for Leah because. He's dangerous when he breaks the pocket. Sometimes he's dangerous for Maryland. Sometimes he's dangerous with the opponent. And then I think the option offense will be difficult for the Nebraska defense that's struggling. Yeah. Well, and, and so I think, you know, for Maryland, if you're going to get things going again, it needs to be that explosive pass game right. because obviously Nebraska is really good against the run. And so that's going to be part of the challenge. But I, I just think we've seen so much from Nebraska and we've seen them grow and continue to get better. And I thought it was really interesting that Matt Rule after this said that like their team has learned how to win, but winning in November is different. And that's what Maryland also needs to learn, right? They need to learn how to win these games down the stretch in the stretch run of the season when you really need them. So there's just so much at stake in this game for both teams. And I actually think that Nebraska watching that game slip away last week where I think we all thought they were going to become bowl eligible against Michigan State actually is kind of lights a fire under them. And it, it allows Matt Rule to keep everybody focused coming off a game like that because you can't just assume that you're going to win any game against an opponent that's on a losing streak or hasn't won a Big Ten game. I was surprised Matt Rule made the comment about uh, the officiating and, and the signals. That's not like him style. He kind of stepped out of character there. He kind of been, I'm all business, no excuses, and straight yeah. down a narrow road. So that was a little unusual. Yeah, game. interesting. I, I, I do find what you just said about, uh, you know, kind of the, hey, if you don't keep your eye on the ball here, that, that things could go south even against a team that isn't playing well as they did Probably against helps Michigan this State. Too. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, it's. Because they had had, we talked so much about the turnovers and the mistakes with Nebraska, and they had had three straight weeks where they were turning the ball over just as they had been previously, and yet they were figuring out a way to escape and, and win right. those games. And this reinforces that message that, hey, we're not good enough to do that. They're, they're actually still last in the Power Five in turnover margin. Yeah. And so, it's, it's again, it's pretty incredible they won five games, right. and they are the, on the yeah. precipice of bowl season. Yeah, 22 turnovers. It's actually the most that, that they've had in the most of any team in the nation. So, yeah, it's it's pretty remarkable to be at this point. And you talk about coaches of the year. Yeah. See how they oh, finish? Yeah. yeah. Rule? Absolutely. Probably in that conversation. Uh, we were talking to Nicole, so let's take a look at him. Top of the Big Ten, holding serve. Ohio State's still number one. Michigan is three. Penn State moved up in spots at number 10. And Iowa, for all of its offensive struggles, makes its season debut at number 22. So, the Big Ten with three of the top ten that is tied for the most – with the SEC, they also have Iowa, as I said, now uh, in that rankings. Do we feel like this is an indication of respect for the Big Ten, or is this simply about respect for those particular teams? Uh, I think it's a combination, because you still have Ohio State at number one, and the question, only question I had coming into this week's ranking was if Georgia was going to leapfrog them, now that they had finally played somebody. Because really, the committee was saying with Georgia and Michigan, we think these are really good teams, even though they don't have ranked wins. And then Georgia gets one. So, by keeping Ohio State still there, there's a lot of respect for what the Buckeyes have done to date. And actually, they also gave some respect to Rutgers. They said that was a top 20 right. defense. Um, yep. And so, it was impressive that Ohio State won it. So, I think that they are watching these teams. They are looking at them very closely, giving them respect. And I think Iowa sneaking in as well does that. You have to watch those 20 to 25 ranking spots because that's how you can be like, hey, they got yeah. all these extra top right. 25 right. wins, yes. right? Yes. So, that is not insignificant that Iowa is in that, that group. I think the, the answer to the respect question is I think they respect those teams more than the league. Just like I don't follow the SEC, but I respect Georgia because they're a good team. That doesn't, I don't have an opinion about Vanderbilt and some of the other teams. So there I was think, a time where you had a strong opinion. Yeah, I did. But, but I, I, so I think it respects those three teams. The only thing that bothers me is this conversation where people say Ohio State has the best resume, but I'm not sure they're the best team. I, I mean, it's kind of contradictory, right? I mean, Do you think the best the team? Best I, no, I haven't watched all the teams, so okay. I don't know. I'm saying that someone that says that, watch the tape and decide who you like better. Instead. Right, but what they're saying is I, I don't believe that this is an eye test question. I believe this is a resume question. It's, it's deserving versus best, right? right? We, don't, we don't need a committee to do a resume. We just hire some person and put them in the corner and tell them, Tell them, right, tell we did that for years and no one liked that. <laughs> Why do they have to be in the oh, corner? I, no, I liked it. The BCS? Right, but no, no. P people were saying we shouldn't leave this up to computers. Yeah, we should so have should a, human, a human, element. human element. Yeah. Right, but you're still saying it's not the eye test. 
What I'm saying is the people who say Ohio State is number one based but on their might, resume. But might not be the best team. But, but are, are subscribing. Yeah to resume versus yeah. object. Right? So that leads us to the next question. How is the best way to decide what's the best team? Well, this is what we're saying, that they made it a human element so that individuals could decide how much they want to weigh those and combine eye test versus resume so that you do have, because the goal would be Fair. to have four of the, the four best teams right. that deserve to be there. So they've hit the qualifications, conference championships, whatever are those criteria, but you want really good teams playing each other. So you, ideally, you get good games. We haven't always had that, but that would be the goal at the end of the season. So if you were running the operation and you had to make a choice of I only can use one, eye test or resume, what, would you, what, what do you think is more accurate? Don't you think you have to say, not accurate, but don't you think you have to rely on the resume? Because I, I, know, I'm like, I don't think I'm, if you were asking me that question, yeah. I don't want to answer for Nicole. Yeah. I don't think I'm qualified to do the eye test. I watch a ton well, of. No, so, let's say you had qualified yeah. people. Yeah, no, let's no, no. Say, but, yeah. but but how else? Why else would you ever play a challenging game if you only went off eye test, right? If you just yes. blew people out right. and you're like, right. they look well, like the but best. But this right. is the problem with the whole thing. And I right. talked about this because with you Joel really haven't answered this the question. Week. Let's say you had qualified people, you had resume qualified people. What do you and want them to do? I would go with the eye test if I had to make okay. the decision, but I wouldn't. But does that I wouldn't let four random people, not random people, but four ex-coaches that are volunteers so they can go on this junket at the end of the season. Right. I would. Alan Truth taught me this. Our recruiting guy, Alan. How do you learn how to evaluate film? If I was recruiting again, I'd hire Alan to evaluate. Just because I'm a coach doesn't mean I can. Right. Watch it. So hire experts, if pay them you, a ton of money. If you do that, though, how do you then incentivize? playing a conference schedule or winning a conference championship like that that being a goal so that's why i think it's yeah. a, it's a meld it's a mi it's it's trying to be a mix the problem is you end up having one person try to explain all of this and not get anyone in trouble right so that's yeah. where you run into yeah. like well how what are they leaning on this year but yeah it's a i mean ideally it is a mix of both of those and that's why you have people who can evaluate the film in the but room. Nicole, doesn't, doesn't the resume include the film study? In other words, the, the, the resume, I'm watching Ohio State play Penn State. So yes. that's part of their resume. Yes. I'm watching Ohio State play Notre Dame. That's part of their resume. So isn't watching video evaluating the resume? I mean, I can tell that, um, I don't want to say a team, it's not any good. I might not even look at that tape. So, uh, yes, but for the teams that don't have the challenging opponents, that's where I think you say, okay, well, Georgia and Michigan hadn't played ranked teams. We think they're good. They're dominant, or mm -hmm. Michigan in particular was dominant on both sides of the ball. That's what you would expect against an inferior team. But you don't have that data point where it actually, like, you believe that they're playing a, a team yeah. that's equally talented or close to that. So, I, again, it, it's complicated, but I do prefer having a human element to that, to, to have all of that instead of just saying, only unbeaten teams, or if you have a loss, you know, it knocks you out. The way that the BCS did, it was still easier just to go unbeaten. Didn't really matter who you played, right. and you could get there. I think it's still better to have that, that dynamic. The right, but they're still ranking all of the undefeated teams in a group, and then the one loss team. They, like they've that, never incentivized schedule. No. They claim they were going to incentivize schedule, and they haven't done that, and they better do it next year. You make a great because point. It's hard to believe one of those one-loss teams isn't better than of one course. of those. Yeah. It's absurd. Well, or Oregon's yeah. one that I point to, Texas, yeah. full strength. But, yes, yeah. yes, they need to do that. They still haven't had a two-loss team make the playoff. Right. So, again, so, like, for as much as – resume or whatever, it hasn't mattered if they don't think they're one of the best teams because they don't have like, as many losses. I guess I, I would say I think the, the undefeated teams might all be better than the one-loss teams, but you can't convince me all the one-loss teams are also all better than the two-loss teams. Right? Yeah. Somewhere in there, there's got to be. Sure. Right? There's, there's just got to be. So you're saying, I, I, I'd have to look at it. This is interesting. So so there are groups. In other words, yes. there's no two-loss team above one loss uh, team. Are there this year? I don't think so. Some years they That's haven't. Really right now, I don't this think year, there are. Not, not at this That's point. That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. And this wow. year, it's the five unbeatens, and then yeah. you go oh, to I the knew one that. Losses. Yeah, but the, huh? yeah. Up next, we got some urban analysis. This <laughs> win taking on an Indiana team that's coming off a big win. Two teams that weren't feeling so great a week ago, feeling better now. What do you find compelling in this one? Yeah, both coming off a win and matchup opponent, right? This, these are both games that these both staffs, both players look at. You know, this we can win it. You know, when when Tom Allen made the change to Rod Carey, I didn't really think it was going to make that much difference. I was wrong. I think it has made a significant difference, especially early in the game with a script. But they may have been doing that under Walt Bell, as well. So I think Indiana has found their niche offensively. I think the same thing's true about Illinois, except obviously they have an injury at quarterback. We don't know what's going to 
going to happen there. So these matchup games, I think it's going to come down to quarterback play perhaps and turnovers. Yeah, I was going to mention the turnovers because if Indiana doesn't turn the ball over, we've only seen this happen twice this year, good things can happen. Yep. And that was one of the things that I took away from this game. Plus, lack of penalties. If you can be clean, I think the cleaner team is going to win this game because, like you said, they're very similar, similar offensive strengths and weaknesses and concerns, questions, how are they going to score, what are they going to do. There's a lot to like defensively, though. There's some real great playmakers on both sides in this one. So, again, it's about the offenses. It's the pressure on the quarterbacks. It's not making mistakes. You do worry a little bit about Indiana in terms of pass protection because they don't run the ball great. Yeah. And as you mentioned, the, the real defensive headliner in this game, as good as Aaron Casey is, he's really good on the other side. But it's Johnny Newton. I yeah. mean, he, he can really right. wreck your, your game plan in a hurry. And so can they protect against Johnny Newton? We've seen this year a little bit better yeah. than what they've been in recent years. Minnesota is a game back of Iowa. Remember, though, they have the tiebreaker against the Hawkeyes. They go to Purdue. It's a game Minnesota cannot lose. No, and, and we were talking about this before the show, but Minnesota has had the West right there, right within their grasp. They've had some right. really painful losses that have cost them, and that's why they're not in the driver's seat. So you've got to win this game. This is a Purdue team that's turned the ball over, made a lot of mistakes. Uh, been up and down and questions defensively. There's just so many issues there. Minnesota, if you can run the ball and play good defense, you should be okay. You should be able to take care of business against a Purdue team, again, that's having a, that's really struggling through first-year head coach. You know, I look at this, and it's fascinating about this game, how two, two groups could have such a drastic approach to the same thing, right? I mean, Purdue's the air raid. Uh, P.J. wants to run the ball. Uh, so th that, that's an interesting slant to it. Uh, I think the Minnesota offense has found their way. I think it's, it's taken a little bit of time. I think the preparation for this game is interesting. It, it, Minnesota has to get their defense ready for a passing attack. They don't throw the ball that much. The more difficult, I think, preparation is Purdue trying to train their defense during the week to stop an aggressive downhill run game. So I always, when I look at two opponents that come at it drastically different, I always say, who has the better preparation? And I think it's Minnesota easily, easier to prepare for a passing team than a passing team to prepare for a run team. Well, and how about this stat? I'm going to steal it in case you already have it. All right. Because I, He's always, have I know it, he probably yeah, already yeah. has this. Minnesota 5-0 and when allowing fewer than 200 passing yards. 0-4 oh, when they give up more. Yeah. Well, uh, Hudson right? Card's been struggling here lately. I'm, I'm a little surprised that Hudson Card hasn't been better. I, I don't think yeah. it's all on his shoulders. It's not. But man, Higher expectations. Man, he was great when we were at camp. Yeah, he's, he was just great talent, which I yeah. think he is. But, you know, it's a lot of parts. No, I understand. So. Yeah. What about motivation level, Jerry, For particularly for Purdue here? Because now all of a sudden you're probably out of the bull hunt again. There's... We talked about this earlier in the week. There's the possibility you get in with five wins, but unlikely. How do you keep your group motivated? You find a way. I mean, you, 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 you wake up Sunday morning or go to bed Saturday night. You have to find what's going to motivate a team that may not be going to a bowl game in the first year. Now with the portal, I mean, more than ever, when a team's in distress, you, you better be a motivator, whether that's meet individually every player on the team before the week's over or whatever. You gotta find a way. It's your job to find a way. You better find it. It's not just, you don't just move on. It's a problem. Right. Again, the motivation, no doubt, is there for Minnesota as we talk about still in that West Hunt. The issue for them is Ohio State next week. So, yeah, they have the tiebreaker in Iowa, but they certainly have the more difficult schedule than the Hawkeyes do. Finally, Wisconsin and Northwestern, it sounds like it's not out of the question that Tanner Mordecai could play, that Braylon Allen could play, that Ben Bryant could play on the other side for Northwestern. I'm not saying they're going to play, but no one's kind of said they're not going to play this week. Whereas, for instance, with Bryant last week, we've known for a couple weeks, David Braun said, no, he's, he's not going to play. So that's interesting here. Also interesting just to kind of get a sense for where things are with Wisconsin, Jerry. I mean, that was a tough loss a week ago. It's the kind of game you don't expect to lose. And now how can you kind of circle the wagons and get going again? Right, so I went back to the beginning of the year, right? The air raid offense, and yet they were leading the conference in rushing. Okay, then I went back and watched first down against Indiana. How about this? 33% was what, that's their success on first and 10. They threw 11 passes on first and 10. Two were complete. They ran the ball. They were second and long most of the day. 
So they can't operate that way. You know, whether you line up in the I formation, whether you line up in Phil Longo's spread formation, if they don't run the ball on first and ten against a four and five Northwestern team who's playing as hard as any team in the conference, they're going to be in jeopardy. This is a matchup game. Yeah. But that's what's hard when you've had so many injuries to both of your yeah. running backs. I mean, right? What, yeah. else, what yeah. else can you try? Uh, right. I mean, that's where, like, the, the, all of those iffy and questionables, like, that's going to decide the game. Who, I, I think so, healthy? too. Like, if Braylon true. Allen plays, it's a totally different yeah. game than if he doesn't play for exactly the reasons you outlined. Right, but incomplete is second and ten. Uh, a, a bad run is second and eight. It's still the lesser of two evils. They, you, you know, two passes complete out of 11 first and ten. You know, they that's got to be adjusted. Yeah. And they got to put the pressure on the offensive line again. Well, and there's a lot at stake now for Northwestern. Like, a bowl is not yeah. without grasp. Right. Yeah. Not out, out of grasp. And you talk about if they get to five, you know, we know APR is is kind of where it starts. That Northwestern shines in APR. So they have a great chance, even if they only end up with five wins, of getting themselves to a bowl. We would be remiss if we did not mention that today is November 10th, and everybody – 